Hey church, it's Wednesday night. Uh, we're just going to do a short thing tonight. I uh, haven't been at work today. We were closed for a variety of reasons today. Um, and so that means I didn't have any quiet time over lunch to record this. I am sitting at home. I have bribed the children with video games to go to their rooms and be quiet for just a few minutes. But we're holding the madness at bay. And so we're just going to jump through some things real quick like. And uh, then I'm going to release them on the world once again. I uh, want to share with you just a few things tonight as we continue with this story about who God is from the theologian Walter Brueggemann. He's an Old Testament scholar. And uh, in doing some work for school a couple of weeks ago, I ran across some stuff that he did and I found it very helpful as we think about who God is and answering the call of um, those who cry out of the darkness. And so this is, again, just going to be pro probably a fairly short thing, but hopefully to give you something of a framework, some sort of context for thinking through the way that, uh, that we uh, talk about the sorts of things we've been talking about, this helpful tool in our toolbox. And so Brueggemann, in his experience, uh, years and years and years of studying uh, the Old Testament, he notes, particularly in this case he was talking about the Psalms, that the worship of Israel in the Old Testament, uh, and we might argue the worship of the church in the New Testament on through history, primarily takes two forms. Um, and we see both of these forms in the Old Testament story. We see both of these forms in the New Testament story. And these two general categories, these two broad forms that worship takes, is on the one side, um, obviously, praise. Uh, this is when we, you know, we give praise to God, thanksgiving to God. We are grateful for all of the things that God has done, and it tends to be upbeat, and it tends to be joyous, and all of those things. And that's a big part of worship. As a matter of fact, in our context, that may be the biggest part of worship. One of the things that we actually want to wrestle with is that um, the vast majority of our worship is characterized by praise, and that has certain implications with it that will become clear here in a minute as we go along. Uh, but in Israel's worship, particularly, again, in the Psalms, but you see it sometimes in the prophets as well and throughout the history of, of Israel, there's this second category that is almost, um, in the Psalms, equally represented with praise, and that is a worship that is characterized by lament. And um, lament in the Psalms is when things aren't going well. Lament is when uh, everything is not right in the world and rather than um, bringing uh, our thanksgiving to God with joy, thank you for doing these things, for the way things are. Uh, lament is when we bring our petitions to God. Um, we bring our petitions to God from a place of brokenness, a place of darkness, and we ask God to do something in the world. And so we might characterize lament like this. It is crying out to God in the darkness. This is uh, what we have been talking about. This is Adam's, or Abel's, rather, blood crying out from the ground in Genesis chapter 4. This is uh, the children of Israel crying out in their bondage in Exodus chapter 2 and then Exodus chapter 6. This is... Uh, the uh, mothers in and around Bethlehem crying out in their grief in the darkness of Matthew chapter 2. These are the martyrs in uh, Revelation there through 5, 6, 7. As the seals are being broken, crying out to God, how long will you let all of the, um, the brokenness and the oppression and the darkness of our situation continue? Uh, this is the um, this is the mode of lament in uh, the Bible, and so Brueggemann's main observation is that worship in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the history of the church, it it falls into these two categories. Uh, but these two categories, taken by themselves, uh, they tend to get twisted in particular ways that aren't as helpful as they might otherwise be. Uh, particularly, he uh, aims his sights at uh, notions of praise. And he does that because we live in a context where uh, worship has uh, almost completely been flattened into praise. And so, um, you know, our songbooks, uh, 
praise and harmony, praise hymns, we we oftentimes just uh, assume on the one side that worship is that portion of when we come together where we're singing songs and we sing praise songs when we come together. We have uh, praise teams in some of our churches and our church neighbors up the road have praise bands. And so uh, we have a very praise dominant culture. And uh, we've experienced this a lot of ways in our lives. I'm sure you've experienced something similar to the way the way I've experienced it, where um, everything might be falling apart and everything might be going wrong and your life might really stink and you might fight with your wife and your children from the time you get up on Sunday morning and all the way to the church building. But the second your tires hit the church property, you get out and uh, all of that screaming is gone. All of the fighting is gone. All the problems are gone. Somebody says, how you doing, man? You say, I'm doing fine. And part of the impulse to do this, to hide the brokenness, is we have kind of built this way of doing church, this church culture, this common way of thinking about things, um, in which everything is good and we're all blessed and nothing is wrong and everyone is put together and isn't God good praise Jesus, right? And on its face, there's nothing wrong with um, a lot of those things. You know, there's certainly nothing wrong with counting our blessings and seeing the ways that God has blessed us and and praising him for that. But what Brueggemann notes is that uh, oftentimes praise is co-opted. Praise is um, kind of hijacked and it becomes twisted in ways that aren't helpful. And so uh, one of the ways that happens is in a culture where everything for a certain group of people is going well and everything is um, fairly comfortable and you're eating kind of high on the hog and, and there aren't a lot of problems, praise in those instances become oftentimes a way of, um, Brueggemann notes, a way of ignoring, oftentimes not on purpose, but just becoming blind to um the plight of those who don't have it as good as we do you know praise is he says praise is the worship of a group of people who aren't asking for god to change anything praise is the worship of a people for better or worse who like the way things are going because at his heart, we're saying, God, praise you for the way things are. Praise you for what you have done. Praise you for what you have given me. Praise you for the way that things are right in the world. And if we have a diet exclusively of praise, it's really easy for us to kind of fall into that way of thinking about things. And so the more comfortable we are, the more affluent we are, the more accustomed we are of getting our way, the more likely we are to be just a people of praise, a people that offers nothing but praise. And in those contexts, when we are accustomed to nothing but praise, again, worship is reduced to praise. Our songs are reduced to praise songs. Those who lead us in singing are our praise leaders, are our praise group, or our praise team, or or in other traditions, our praise band, you know, those sorts of things. When it gets reduced to that, um, when this other half of worship in the Old Testament comes out, it uh, can seem really odd to us. When someone comes in and because of the circumstance in their life, they find that they need to not praise but lament, um, it can seem odd to us. Oftentimes, you know, we might wonder why they're bringing things down. Oftentimes, we might wonder why they're not just appreciative for what they have. Oftentimes, um, we might think that their attitude is somewhat inappropriate, that that is not actually worshiping God because I didn't walk away feeling uplifted. I didn't walk away feeling excited. I wasn't moved. I, I wasn't fed in the ways that we typically think about how worship is supposed to go in our moments of praise. Lament doesn't offer itself to those sorts of things. But the Psalms, Brueggemann would say, and the worship of the Old Testament people of God and the worship of the New Testament people of God, Brueggemann would remind us, uh, 
gives legitimacy to lament as a form of worship. This is an expression of faithfulness because people in the darkness cry out to God and they wrestle with God and they come to God looking for God to act as God, uh, looking for God to act as he has revealed himself to be as the I am, right? And so lament is that form of worship that rather than saying to God, everything is great the way it is, is it's the form of worship where they come to God and they say something like, God, we really need you to change some things. We need you to do something here. And the danger Brueggemann would say, and this is what I want us to think about, the danger Brueggemann would say is in an affluent society, uh, particularly with us as a subset of an affluent society. And, uh, you know, the, the simple truth is, even with, um, for my instance, income somewhere in the middle class, um, I stand as one of the wealthiest people in the world. Uh, my household income is is up there in the top percentiles of wealthiest people in the world, and yours probably is too. I'm not going to make that judgment for you. There are websites you can go to and you can enter in your income and you can figure that out. Um, when you live as I do, sitting on top of the pile, it becomes easy to turn a blind eye to those who have a different story and a different experience. But what lament calls us to do is it calls us to listen to that cry for change. To resist that temptation to simply say, but I don't want anything to change. Everything is good for me. Everything is the way it's supposed to be for me. I'm comfortable. I'm affluent. Everything's working well. To resist that temptation because we've been called to love neighbor. And it's through loving our neighbors that we love God. And to maybe even join them in their cry for God to bring change. To maybe even join God who hears that cry in acting for change. And it is ultimately, uh, Brueggemann would suggest, through the worship of lament, through wrestling with God in the darkness, through crying out to him uh, so that he can answer our cry in the darkness, like he did in Exodus, like he did in the Gospels that we talked about last week, like he did in Revelation, like we've seen in, in so many different places. It is through that lament and God hearing and honoring and listening to and answering that lament that we come to actual genuine expressions of praise. Um, this is, of course, what we see in Exodus. And I'm going to stop after this one uh, because everybody, I can hear them behind me. They're getting antsy. If I just talk louder and faster, you won't hear them. But uh, they're all hyper today. Um, this is what we see in Exodus. It starts in chapter 2 with lament. They cry out in the darkness. It starts in chapter 6 with lament. They cry out under their oppression. But God hears that cry. He says, this is um, indicative. This is core to who I am as the God who is present. The I am. And he comes into the situation and through uh, the plagues and through his action at the Red Sea, he brings deliverance to the Israelites. He hears their cry. He brings change. And as they stand liberated, freed, brought out of their darkness on the far side of the Red Sea in Exodus 15, what do they do? They break out in praise. And so um, we need a steady diet of both things in our life. We need that lament that trust in God to hear and answer so that it will give way to genuine expressions of praise because God is acting in the world and that we are joining him and acting in the world as his people, right? Um, we need praise, but not a steady diet of praise, not a cheap praise. Praise is just for praise's sake because sometimes that causes us to be blind to the cry of our sisters and brothers. Um, so as we're moving forward, I want us to keep this framework in mind. There is the praise and there is the lament. And those are not supposed to be separate from one another. And both are legitimate expressions, but they work hand in hand. All right. So I'm going to let you guys go. I hope that you have a good Wednesday night. And we will talk to you a little later. Don't forget this isn't recorded live. 
Um, I'm going to post this here in a few minutes, either on YouTube or on Facebook. Feel free to leave comments, questions, additions, subtractions, those sorts of things. I would love for this to be a conversation as much as it can with me sitting in a recliner in Crossville, Tennessee, and you guys spread out over who knows where, a lot of you in Fairview, Tennessee, hours away. Um, I don't check social media terribly often, um, but I will check in on this, and if you have something to say, we will talk. All right? Church, we love you. Have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye.